for you, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Yes, we can. Okay. So our guest speaker for today is a very experienced safety professional. Gochi Obidegu is a social development strategist with a specialty in developing products, programs, and providing policy advisory on pressing development issues affecting young Africans. Her major work, her major work pillars are around ensuring child safety, reducing substance abuse in youth, and providing strategy for social impact initiatives. She is the author of a child safety storybook series available in English and French, co-creator of an online safety game for children, and a developer of social impact apps the safety chick compass and up program so let's give a round of applause as we welcome the safety chick and i believe it's going to be a very very enlightening session over to you presenter thank you good morning um the president of um, american society of safety professionals mr um, Sheo kabir um, good morning to the leadership of the Women in Safety Excellence. I really love when you keep saying a common interest group, because that is why today's topic is very important, led by Kemi and all the executives of the Women in Safety Excellence currently present. Good morning again to the current past executives of the Women in Safety Excellence. And um, good morning to my senior colleagues in the industries, the um, I can see in the comment in the attendance list that um, I have um, my mentor, Mrs. Monica Musu. I have um, the, Mr. Temitope Mudele from Ayosh, and um, I'm still learning a lot of people's names in the industry. Please forgive me, but I am excited to be here with you this morning. It's about um, 5.17 a.m. here, but <laughs> I decided that this was really important and um, we all have a role to play as safety professionals in making sure that things work out in our organization, in the country. We are not just for only one part, we are for the entire country and how we position ourselves and try to achieve things is going to make a difference. So thank you so much to the Women in Safety Excellence for inviting me to have this conversation. And I hope that this um, places a seed in each and everyone's heart and then we'll begin to think of what are the things we need to do to begin to go forward. So I'm going to share my screen now. Please confirm that you can hear me Clearly. I'm hearing you loud and clear. Okay, all right. So sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. So, yes. Okay, awesome. So our topic is the role of safety associations in nationwide child safety education and um, as we begin to you know go through it you're going to understand why this was a topic that was chosen and why it's not just um, child safety education it is nationwide <laughs> because that's the level we are on now we have to take it by force we can no longer keep on just waiting and doing things in small corners and doing things as a collective is going to multiply our impact Okay. My name is Mugwechi, um, like I've been introduced, founder of the Safety Chick. The Safety Chick is a child safety social enterprise. We create um, edu safety education products for African children and stressing on African children because we realize that there are many safety education resources that are out there, but 
it is not African themed and representation really matters. Earlier this week, I was in the Dominican Republic. I went for a task and I was telling some of the Americans I was with that the difference between America and I mean, the difference between Dominican Republic and Nigeria is just that they're speaking Spanish. You can literally just lift the people <laughs> and swap. The only difference is there will be a language barrier because they look like us. I'm, I'm serious, they really look like us. And we entered into one of these classes and one of the, the children was talking to one of the colleagues and said, you're all Americans. And the person said, no, 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 look, and pointed at me and said, no, she's African. And the boy actually did like this. He looked at his skin tone and then looked at me looked again and then smiled and who would have thought that a child would have made that comment but you see representation does something to the minds of p of people that you don't even know whether it is a child looking for an adult that looks like where they are going to or even an adult looking to another adult that is representing where they are going to so anyway that's why we are creating african theme safety education products because representation is important and the convener of the annual school safety summit founder of ugip foundation a faith-based non-profit developer of social impact apps and i'm a tedx speaker so i have some stats for you according to the center for disease control unintentional injury is the leading cause of death in children below 14. The International Journal of Public Health gives an estimate of the number of children under the age of 50 who are killed by an injury, and between 10 million to 30 million of these suffered a non-fatal injury. So an estimated 644,855 died, but 10 million to 30 suffered a non-fatal injury. I feel like that is that stat is too much. It's a lot of children having these issues that could really have been avoided. And then Sub-Saharan Africa, on the other hand, is credited with the highest rates, like the highest of unintentional injuries. And I saw a report by, the, by UNICEF on developing countries where it says that annually over 2 million children experience accidents in and around the home. So why is this conversation important? Our workforce today, today's young people are going to be tomorrow's workforce. And I'm sure if you've been seeing the trends of the projection of what is going to be happening in the coming years, Africa is going to be the one with the largest population of young people. Other continents, their population is getting older, is dying off, but in our own case, we are increasing at a huge frequency. It's not going to be great for us if when it is time for us to benefit from that huge advantage that we have compared to the world. We are having children who have either already died or who are currently subjected to a reduced quality of life because they had accidents when they were growing up. Accidents that could have been avoided because when I've done my research, I have seen that truly many of the accidents that are affecting young people to a really large extent, they are all avoidable. So, it is really important that we are focusing on building young people now. These are the people that are going to work in organizations as safety officers or safety coordinators in future. If we have not ingrained certain attributes in them, it makes it hard for them to do the right thing. Now, if we have not ingrained the right safety culture in young people, it makes it hard for whoever will be the safety officer in future because you are making their work hard. I like to use this example that if all your life as adults, everybody seated currently now in this room, You've been eating with your right hand and somebody comes to you and says you have been doing this all wrong the best way for you to eat and the nutrients will get into your body properly is to use your left hand now because you have had nutrients you would most likely want to try to eat with your left but because for at least a minimum of 20 years you have been eating with your right it's going to be hard at some point if nobody's watching you you're going to say i beg i beg all these years I've not died. It's not now that I'm going to die because of nutrients. You would switch. And that is the same thing why it is important to train younger people now because when we impute the necessary skill set in them, it grows with them, it becomes a part of them. So it becomes natural so that when they step into our workplaces, they know what to do. Many of you must have encountered adults who came to the workplace and it was because you were giving them a safety training as part of their orientation activities that was the first actual safety training that they were experiencing it shouldn't be 
So it's really important that we build today's young people. Why else is this topic very important? No matter how much you love your children, because again, I know that in this house we have parents who are right here with us. You are not going to be with your child 24 seven. It's either because of work or emergency, something is going to happen that would ensure that you are not there. So when you are not there, are you confident that your children are going to know what to do? Are you confident that the person that you are leaving with your children would know what to do? Are you confident that when you send them to school and they meet certain things there, they can stand their ground? We all know the story that trended on social media, what happened outside the country with a certain school, another school where a child was bullied and eventually died. We've, we've heard, we're hearing stories. And it's not like these things haven't been happening before, but thanks to social media, it's becoming more obvious, it's becoming more amplified. And so we, knowing that we will not always be with them, it's important that we do something about it now. Another reason why this is important is that evil is becoming bolder. I think about last week or two weeks ago, I shared a post on um, the Instagram handle of the safety chick from someone who was sharing how he, he went to a school, I think either one of the Western states, and a young boy wrote anonymously that his lesson teacher was molesting him. She would always ask him to put his hand in her private part, and he didn't know what to do. And guess what? After I shared that story on social media, I got a lot of DMs of guys, not children now, adults, telling me that they experienced a shade of that. It's either it was a lesson teacher or someone in church or one pastor or one uncle or one neighbor. I'm talking of guys now. Many times when we think of abuse, we think it's only girls or maybe guys, it's just a, little, ah, it's just a man. Mm -mm. A child is a child. You don't make them to advance faster than what they are supposed to advance into. And so we have this case of your many men who living through this experience. In fact, many people have not even spoken about it to anyone. And it's maybe when they see posts like that, that they would say something because maybe they didn't understand what was going on. So for many children, the first time that they are encountering a safety situation, they are not sure of what to do because nobody prepared them beforehand. So evil is get, getting bolder. And if you have not done your part to prepare the children, when they meet certain things, they are not sure of how to respond. And so they decide in their own childlike wisdom on, okay, I'm not going to tell anybody, or okay, I will sort it out myself, not knowing that there is help available because nobody has said anything to them. Again, we also have unsafe scenarios becoming more prevalent. I shared a video yesterday on Instagram of a child fiddling with the car door while the mom was driving, toddler, and the door opened on the highway. That could really have turned to something else, if not that thankfully she was not really riding at a high speed and was able to stop when people were shouting. And so it's very important that we begin to have these kinds of conversation. And the best way to prevent it is through a systematic education. We can no longer keep on doing things haphazardly or once in a while we organize a program, it is no longer enough. We need to become more intentional about how we're going to pass on this knowledge to the next generation. What currently exists? We currently have some child protection policies in organizations who work with children. Some, not all, because again, many people do not even know what is required to open child, child centers or children's centers as the case may be. We also have some organizations who run child injury prevention programs. So for example, at the Safety Chick, we have the Train Them Young Initiative where we visit schools across the country or wherever we're invited and we teach children how to stay safe. But you see, we do it like when we are invited or when we map out some schools to go to, it is not on a systematic level. Field trips, we have schools, sometimes even churches who organize um, field trips to maybe um, a fire station or to a place where children can have some extra information on safety. We have storybooks. I myself, I'm the author of a child safety storybook because stories are a great way to teach about any subject. We have games. so. There are games that um, can be played in person, and then there are games that can be played on mobile devices. I worked with Niger Kids in 2020, and we did this online um, safety game for children on how to stay safe during the COVID era. And currently, we're even doing pre-orders for the Adventures of Muna game, because we're trying to see how can we ensure that we use things that children can relate with and can be easily accessible to pass on the safety message. 
But then we also have people, organizations, safety organizations, and even other organizations, and some schools who have safety clubs, where they have these clubs in schools, and it's optional for children to be a member of those clubs, and then they can attend and learn topics on safety. So children can act. On my, the first picture you can see on the screen is, so on your left is the picture of a five-year-old girl. Her name is Chloe Woods. Sometime a few years ago, she saved her blind grandmother from a burning building. And when they came out and, you know, fire service was called because it happened in the U.S. And they asked her, how did you know what to do to bring yourself and your grandmother out? And she said their school had visited a fire station. And so they had told them when there is smoke in the building, go down low and crawl out. And so she just told her grandmother, just go down, go down on your knees, let's crawl out. And that was what they did. Imagine if she didn't know that. She was five, she was with a blind woman. How would they have been able to come out without casualty? In the middle, we have Jacob. He too, 10 year old, and he was, um, he, he noticed he didn't find his younger brother around him. And he stepped out of the house and saw that his younger brother had fallen into the family swimming pool. Immediately, he brought the boy out and then he did CPR. Of course, he didn't, probably didn't know that that was what he was doing, but he was doing what he saw in the movie, San Andreas. In that movie, The Rock, a very um, popular um, Hollywood actor, had pulled somebody out from water and had done CPR. I'm sure if somebody had told Mr. Rock <laughs> that, Someday, a child is actually going to use this to save an actual human being. It would have been hard to believe. But eventually, when the younger brother was taken to the hospital, because it was a really critical situation, the doctor said that that act of him taking that step of doing CPR gave his younger brother a chance at life just because he watched a movie. On the, on the right, this was me in 2018. I had um, just returned from the US from a fellowship and I had the book reading session at a book club. So normally when I have those book reading sessions, I start with a story to make the children know that what we're about to do is very important. And it has happened to some people and I don't want it to happen to you. So I told them of a girl that had actually been kidnapped from church here in Nigeria. I don't want to mention the name of the church at about that time. And explaining to them that this was why it was important, you know, to know what to do when you find yourself in an unsafe situation. And one of the girls here in the picture, she raised her hand and she said, that girl should not have gone with a stranger without asking for the family password. And I'm like, okay, how did you know about the family password? And she said, I've read your child safety storybook before. For me, that was an actual demonstration of the reason we do these things. The fact that a child can watch a movie, can visit a fire station, can read a book, and when they actually find themselves in an unsafe situation, their brain relates it to take action and they know what to do. And this is why we must not disregard the age of children when teaching them about safety. Don't say, ah, they are too small, what can they do? No. Children absorb. It's just like how they observe you doing many things in the house. And it is what they see you do that they do. They don't do as they are told necessarily. They do, they do what they see you do. And that's why it's really important that we model the right things because our children are sponges. They are soaking it all in. Another thing you would have noticed in this story is that the methods used in teaching them were age appropriate. So one fire station, field trip, another one movie, another one is storybook. Because when we're going to try to teach safety to children across the country, we must understand that difference in interesting methods must be used. Otherwise, they are going to lose their attention. And they are in that stage where their mind is always working fast, it's all over the place. If you are not intentional about making it interesting, you are going to lose them and you need their attention. Now, what is the shortcoming of these interventions? As great as they are, as great as having going to schools and training children is, as great as having a game is, as great as field trips are, as great as um, watching movies are, the shortcomings of some of the interventions that have been mentioned is that in some places, it is either non-existent or inadequate. So for many people, they set up um, centers that care for children because they realize that it's a great way to make money, most especially because many of our parents have to go out there and work, so they would need someone to care for their child. We're not against you making money, but you should know what to do. 
And so they need to be educated and you know, follow procedures to have this necessary child protection policies in place. Another shortcoming of the interventions we currently have is that it is infrequent. You cannot learn something if it only happens once in a blue moon. At best, you can learn some parts, but it's not going to be sustainable in the long run because you don't know enough. Again, same for field trips. When field trips happen, maybe once in the lifetime of a child, a visit to a fire station, maybe it happens at maybe primary three or primary four, and that's it. You never ever go to a fire station again. It is not enough. At best, in an emergency, you're going to remember one or two things, but every other thing is lost because if you really want to cause a change, it has to be consistent over a period of time. Another shortcoming of some of these interventions is the fact that we have um, unequal access across the country. And that's because some people do not have enough money. And so when push comes to shove, they would rather use that money to provide for their primary needs, which is most likely food or shelter as the case may be. And so it's like, don't worry, God will protect us. And when a religious part of the world, so people will say, ah, God forbid, it's not my portion. Don't worry, we'll be managing. We cannot continue with the we will be managing syndrome or the God forbid syndrome or the it's not my portion syndrome because hope is not an effective strategy. So what is the way forward? In my own opinion, I feel that the way forward is safety education in schools. And I define safety education as a deliberate and intentional dissemination of safety knowledge in a way the selected target audience will understand. This ensures that this audience is empowered to make better safety choices in different scenarios that may arise. So some key words here is that it is deliberate. It is not a once in a, <laughs> it's not um, just something that happens off the cuff. You have to be intentional about it. You have to make it available in a, in, a, in a way that the target audience will understand. So for example, if I go to primary schools, I just have to read a chapter in my child's safety storybook do we understand? If I'm going to a secondary school, I do a different PowerPoint because they are more advanced. They understand some things better. So I do a more advanced PowerPoint for them. So you must understand your target audience and the best way to reach them. So what are our options currently now? Because I believe that as much as we there are problems, it's always best to come with a solution. It's not enough to just talk about what the problem is. What is the solution? What is the way forward? The first option that we have is to maintain the status quo, which means continue doing what we are currently doing at the moment. And what we currently have in Nigeria as of today is that the basic education curriculum in Nigeria was revised a few years ago, and it was revised to include a subject called religion and national values. In that subject, one of the components is security education. So I went through the curriculum, it's available um, online. I went to the program to check what are the subjects in the security education. So it's more focused on security, you know, maybe because of, you know, the unrest that we have in the Northern part of the country, right? So it's more focused on, you know, that kind of security, you know, kidnap, um, maybe bombs and stuff than injury prevention. And we need injury prevention. We also have some safety topics in social studies so there's like maybe effects of drug abuse and you know stuff like that so if we're going to maintain the status quo it means we'll just stick with what we have the advantage of this maintaining the status quo is that we don't need to spend any other money we just need to continue using what we have abi another advantage is that um it exists so you don't need to run around so you can say ah yeah we have something because I think there's also something on online safety because there was a cybersecurity component added recently. But the disadvantage of this is that it is not enough. The global burden on, um, on um, arising from injury prevention is too much. The statistics is too much for us to just, you know, not have enough content on injury prevention. It also has limited access. Mm -hmm. Yes, limited access. So in the course of doing my research, I realized that as much as this is what is in the curriculum for the country, not all schools are implementing it. And so that means 
there are some schools where children are learning about it and there are schools where children are not learning about it. Schools are supposed to be the level playing ground for all children in all countries, whether it's a public or a private school. At the minimum, there are certain things that must be learned everywhere. So that regardless of your socioeconomic status, whether you're a house boy, house girl, or you come from a poor background or a rich background, you are learning something that every other person is learning alongside you. And so even though maintaining the status quo is great, it is not enough for what we are trying to achieve, which is reducing accidents affecting children as much as is reasonably practicable. The second option we have is to improve teacher preparedness. So in doing my research, I came across this research by Otaru and he was saying that for this religion and national values, we do not have enough teachers who are trained on the subject matter. And some of them also complain that they do not have adequate instructional materials. Now, you all know as safety professionals, because the work you do ensures that you know you keep on doing capacity development. So you're always doing one training or the other. In fact, today you are here on this webinar because you know that knowledge empowers, knowledge is important, and you can only act to the level of what you know. So if the teachers who are supposed to prepare the children do not even know anything about security or safety education, how are they going to pass it across to the children they are supposed to teach? If they do not have the right instructional materials to make their work easy, how are they going to know enough to pass it on? So even though, yes, it exists, some of them got some training, it is not widespread. And we're trying to cut this unequitable access that is currently going on. And then the third option, which I'm recommending to the house and to as many people that are interested in listening to this is to include more injury prevention topics into our existing curriculum and support teacher preparedness. According to SLEED 2018, the global burden of unintentional injuries is too high and we need more injury prevention um, interventions. So on one hand, we have to increase information on injury prevention. On the other hand, we must improve teacher preparedness because if they are not prepared, it's also still going to be a problem. And so what would be the advantage of doing this? The advantage of doing this is that children now have more access to a wider range of injury prevention topics. I attended um, the webinar put together by WISE, I think it was last month, and two of our speakers, Ms. Monica Oso and Isaiah, spoke extensively on the kinds of accidents affecting children. So just imagine that if those areas were chosen as topics adapted to the different age of the children and taught in schools, say on a once a week basis over a period of time. What that means is that you're going to have children who are going to come back to your house and challenge you for some of the wrong things that you're doing. Because you know, they don't need to hide their mouth. If it's not good, it's not good. They will tell you. <laughs> That's the advantage of having um, children. So you need to empower them so that they can speak up. Then it's it, we need to sort out the um, the, the learning gap for teachers. And somebody might look at it and say, oh, it's so expensive to have a nationwide training for teachers. Thanks to COVID, everybody has now seen the importance of e-learning platforms. Some people might see, say, oh, you know, it hasn't reached everywhere, but for the areas it has reached, how about we leverage it to ensure that this message, the same message gets to every part of the country. Every day in this country, before 9 a.m., People have checked WhatsApp. It's almost like WhatsApp is now A, <laughs> you know, for some people, right? And that's to tell you how the, um, in, in turn, the mobile penetration has really gotten into our country. So almost everyone has an internet enabled phone. So just imagine that to cut costs, we have synchronized trainings on what teachers are supposed to know about this injury prevention component and it's on a portal and they just need to go there, access that, have information that they can pass on to the children in their classes. This means somebody in Jigawa, somebody in Enugu, somebody in Akure, wherever you are, you are having access to the same quality content. So if our teachers, if we have the right content, so now it means we have curriculum, someone is writing on my screen. If we have the right content, right? And then we have teachers who are enabled to, um, to deliver that content, then it means that to a large extent, we are going to manage this properly. Because no matter how well you train a teacher, if they do not have the right tools, instructional materials, curriculum to work with, they are still limited. 
do not be able to pass on the knowledge effectively to children. So now, what is the role of safety association? So this is where you all come in. So there, we, there are different strategies for ensuring that this happens in the country, but I'm only sharing one which focuses on safety associations because one of the things that kept on being reiterated when the leadership of this house was speaking is common interest group. It is a common interest group. And a common interest group can act as a pressure group to the government. A common interest group can stand as a collective and tell the government and say, this is what we believe. This is our area of expertise. This is how to get things done. So that we're not just coming with the problem, we are coming with a solution. And so what is the role? Collaborate and partner with government. So I am aware that um, since 2020, when we worked with a team for the national policy on um, safe schools and violence-free schools, one of the things that came out of that um, um, policy um, planning was that they were going to begin to have step downs. So they train a group of people, then those ones go back into their different um, locations and pass on that training to all. So, but the thing is, if you don't have enough manpower to make that happen, it's a problem. And we have the numbers. We have safety professionals in almost every state in this country. Most of our associations have branches across maybe different regions. So we actually have a structure that can help cascade what the government is doing down to where it is supposed to be. Because it is not enough that these things exist if it is not being implemented. If a child somewhere in Zampara is not receiving it in their school or somewhere in Anambra State is not receiving it, then it is a problem. So we cannot keep saying, oh, there we have the curriculum now. Mm -mm. Even if the curriculum exists, if it is not being used by who is supposed to use it, then it is a problem. And we have a structure, so we've got to collaborate, partner with government. We've got to become their implementing partners in different locations. And until we step up to that role, step up to that position, we are hampering what the government is trying to do. Because trust me, government has spent money. Um, during the School Safety Summit last month, I, um, one of our speakers shared two documents, the policy that I was talking about and the minimum standard for safe schools. Up till now, many people don't even know those documents exist, but government spends money bringing together different organizations, parastatals and international NGOs to um, organize these things. I was at one of those, um, the policy one, and they were representatives from different sectors, different associations in that meeting. So that tells you that they have done their part to an extent but if it is not communicated, if it is not shared, if more people don't know about it, it is a problem. And so we that are the guardians of safety in the country, we've got to step up step in, and step into that role and say, we know you have done this. This is what we are proposing. This is how um, we can make it more effective. And then of course, advocacy, because it is a long-term game. So the fact that we wake up today and say, we're going to go and meet them does not mean they want us today. This might take years. The policy that we did during the pandemic 2020 is, this is 2022, some people still don't know. So we're sharing it on um, email lists, WhatsApp groups and stuff. So that tells you that it is a long-term game. We have a long way to go. But if all hands are on deck, if all the safety associations come together, form a collective and say, this is how we want to support because we're looking at the end result of how this can help us position us as a nation, you know, it can go a long way. Then I would say, while we're also waiting for, set all those things in motion, and we're waiting for the solutions to happen, we must support existing solutions. So support what is currently going on with the safety check. We have child safety storybooks that can be used. As a matter of fact, the Nigerian Educational Research and Development um, Council, NERDC, has approved the Adventures of Mona books to be used in schools across the country. And we've also recently introduced a game app, which is going to go live next month. Pre-orders are currently going on. Reason being, while we are waiting, because sometimes the clogs of governance can take a while, bureaucracy, what can we begin to do in our own little spheres? So even though this will not totally solve the problem, because there will, there will always be some children who cannot be reached. Not everybody is going to have a, um, a phone that can play a game. Even books that can reach more people than games may not be able to reach some areas because maybe nobody has money to sponsor it in that location or for one reason or the other. 
But if we play our part to begin to take positive steps, little by little, you would see that all our little drops of water is really going to come together and become an ocean. So I hope that this conversation has, has started to open our minds to possibilities, because I know that here in our midst, we have people who have influence in government. We have people who have people in their network who they can begin to have certain conversations with and say, how can we help you? This is our core area. How can we help you to push this agenda? We have people like that in our midst and we can begin to say, let's move as a collective, set a plan. If you, if we need um, strategies on how to make sure that this gets to different areas. We need options. We need to know who are the people that can collaborate with us towards achieving this. Who are the other stakeholders? Because we are one interest group. There are other interest groups that can work with us. For example, the Association of um, Private Educators of Nigeria or the Association of, of um, Schools in Abuja, all those associations or even um, TRCN, you know, we can work together with those groups and push an agenda that can ensure that children all over the country have access to safety education because it is better to have safety knowledge and not need it than need that safety knowledge and not have it. And it is important for us to empower our younger generation because if we prepare them now, it means that we're reducing future problems along the line. I hope that this was helpful to everyone. Thank you so much for listening to me and we can now have um, questions. Well, thank you, Gochi. It's always very, very enlightening and wonderful to hear you speak. You know, as usual, you always do justice to child safety um, training. So thank you, thank you so much. You've also given wise call to action you know, to go forward and take up some responsibilities to ensure that children are safe. You know, um, the importance of catching them young cannot be overemphasized. You have to keep saying it and saying it. Yes, we are safety professionals. We go to work, we go around our businesses, but how about our family members? Are they safe? So I think we need to start from ourselves and then, you know, within our spheres, our family members and speak to them. So thank you. We've learned so, so much. And I know we'll have lots of questions. So I'll have to hand over to Buki now to take the um, questions and contributions if we have any. Over to you, Buki. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you once again, Ugochi, for that very enlightening session. Um, so far, I'm looking at the comments now. All we can see is a um, lovely presentation, Gucci, fantastic insight. Okay, from Monica was amazing and well articulated presentation, Gucci. Always so proud of you and the work you're doing. So we're open to questions, and remember, it's Saturday and we have things to do. So. We wouldn't want to take every, so much of everybody's time. So please drop your questions in the chat um, section. And if you want to use the other tool of raising your hand to ask your question, please make your questions short and straight to the point. Thank you. All right, um, in the absence of any question, or while we wait for questions, um, we'd like to call on Madam Monica to present the certificate to um, our guest speaker. So over to you, Madam Monica, please. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. President. Um, good morning, the um, administrator wise. It's really indeed been a fantastic presentation. Um, I've learned quite a lot, and I'm sure that a whole lot of us have learned um, quite a lot. Um, recently, I had the opportunity of being in one of the presentations that were made on behalf of one of our one of our mentors that is late. And one of the things that we were all talking about was the need for us to pull our strength together and the need for us to collaborate together. And I think that this is what has been re-emphasized all over again today. Please, I want to confirm if we can see my screen. Can you see my screen? 
Yes, we can see. Go ahead. Okay. So I really want to thank the safety chief, Ogochi, and on behalf of the president, ASSP Nigeria, the WISE administrator, the executive, and the entire WISE women in Nigeria, we want to present Ogochi Obidiego with um, this certificate of recognition for volunteering in our Nigerian chapter as a speaker. Um, uh, and speaking to us on the topic, the role of safety association in nationwide child safety education. We want to really appreciate you for doing justice to this. And I believe that we have a very um, thought leadership. Yeah, we have very, um, we have our leaders in um, ASEA, they are thought leaders. And I believe that some of the solutions that you've shared is something that we already looking at and thinking about. And I have no doubt that some of these solutions will be part of what we are going to use, you know, to strategize for the next, um, for the next session of executives coming in in, um, in our session. We want to really thank you and I appreciate you so much for making our time to present this to us. And of course, be sure that the wise women are coming after you to, uh, for, other engagement as deemed necessary and deemed fit. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, God bless you. All right, thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you. We can give a round of applause or we can give thumbs up if we really, really enjoyed um, the session. I really did. Before we go to the next um, point on the agenda, I just have one question for you, Coach, and I think it would help everybody on the call. At what age, just in a minute you can um, answer, at what age do we begin to give like sex education to young children? What age is the appropriate age for them? Because you know, a lot of things are happening now uh, we can see. So when can we begin to speak to them about you know, things like that? Thank you so much um, for that um, question. It's, uh, it's very important. And I realize that that's a question that um, gets asked a lot, even on Instagram. <laughs> but this is what I'm going to say about that. The topic, when you want to speak to a child about um, sex education, it has to be age appropriate. For example, there are some things that you can say to a child of three years old that is going to be totally in, inappropriate for that same child. But there are some things that you can say to a child of 14 that will be too babyish because they should have passed that level, but to where they are, it is better. So as early as possible, as early as your child begins to understand, even as simple as teaching them about their body parts is the first place to start for really small children. Just teach them about their body parts with the correct names so that when they are making a report of what somebody is doing to them. You are sure of what they are saying. When you keep telling a child to say, it is my thing, um, instead of when you say their penis, for example, they are saying, it is my thing. And then tomorrow, when they come to report that a teacher is touching my thing, even you will not understand what thing they are talking about. So as early as they can speak and as they can understand, start with little for their, for their level. So for those really small children, it can be their body parts, oh, don't touch this, or don't allow anybody to touch this or um, you too, don't touch it up. Because that's another thing. When I teach the children, I tell them, as much as we are saying that no adult should touch you, you too don't go about touching others. Because we also found that some children are the ones molesting other children because one adult has molested them. So there is a cycle. So one by an adult has, <laughs> has gone to go and um, groom a child. That child now comes to start transferring what they know to other people. So when you tell a child that it is only adults that should not touch their body parts, right? And a child is doing it to them. There is dissonance. They are not sure, okay, does this one qualify as what should be reported? Because they didn't tell them that part. So it's very important that as early as possible, as long as the child begins to understand, begin to teach, but ensure that it is age appropriate. I think that is the key information that I'm sharing right now. What you're going to say to a three-year-old is totally different from what you say to a nine or a 10. And again, you must observe the development patterns and the maturity of the child. So there are some children that as early as nine, they're already on their period, breast is everywhere, you know, again. So that's why you must be observant. Don't be afraid. I know 
you will see parents that they will become so afraid that hey she's still a child but all these breasts and so you, you are trying not to say some things it is better to empower a child let them know the boundaries so that if something outside that begins to happen they can take action i always like to share this story um that barista king lami shared of a popular school in lagos where a teacher had asked the girl a funny question either he asked if she had um, kissed somebody before if she had a boyfriend it was a question that was off limits that he asked her and she got home and she told her mom and she said you told me that if somebody asked me this question i should let you know the next day plus the mother and father they went to that school guess what they discovered that that teacher because in the course of investigation that teacher had molested other girls because it's a secondary school a popular secondary school they had molested other girls and instead of we having inappropriate conversations with them so but now somebody else because her parents had told her when so and so happened let me know that was how it was found out so you can see that we parents adults we have a role to play when um in, in, in preparing our children so when they encounter certain things because somebody has said it to them they have better knowledge on how to respond Absolutely. Thank you so much, Igoti. Thank you. You've answered it, and I'm sure you've helped a lot of us, you know, to answer that question. Um, President's hand, right, is, hand is up. Okay, that was what okay. I even wanted to talk about. Um, we have a question from Semito Mudeli on the chat group. He said, most government and private interventions on child safety in schools have been focused on private schools and little or none on public schools, where we have a more significant percentage of pupils, what will be the best approach to intervene in public schools' child safety, where the pupils are exposed to many social vices, including smoking, touting, sexual abuses, etc.? I totally agree with this question because we have the bulk, and that's why when we do our safety interventions, we don't just only go to private schools. We try to get donors who can help us buy resources so that we can also go to public schools because they, children in public schools are more susceptible to the unsafe situations and scenarios that may arise. So to solve this particular problem of public schools, two ways. The first way is what we have done today by saying, how can we partner with government to take their interventions? Um, Towards the end of last year, one of the person who coordinates this stuff in Abuja asked me to mention NGOs that are doing work on child safety. And I remember I reached out to some of you to get your contact details so that I could submit. So they were really particular about NGOs because their, their strategy is if we can get these NGOs and train them, then we send them to go to their communities and train their communities, organize a training there. But you see, that is where safety associations can also come in. Safety associations are professional associations. They are not a business. So they can actually be um, categorized. Depend well, please check your documentation, what CAC records you as. But to a large extent, associations could perform the roles that um, NGOs are performing. So we can add um, um, advocacy to what we are doing. So government has to work in the sense of when you have said you have the curriculum, you have the material cascade it down, let implementation reach everywhere. But the second part is because we know how cumbersome governments can be, the bureaucracy, how these things can take time. We as associations must start something. We can, define, we can design a plan and say, we are going to cover so-and-so um, public schools in our jurisdiction and we share it, split it across. We, if we, we don't need all the safety professionals in one, in one school. It can be an assignment. So every month, two people go to different schools spread across. And that way, you are not going to solve the entire problem that you have started. You are taking a significant step in that direction. So while we are waiting for government to sort out its own bit and push things, because it was, it's going to be slow. It's going to be slow. But see, that's why we need to keep on applying pressure. We, keep, we need to keep on talking about it. We need to keep on sharing about it. But while we are waiting for them to do that, we have to be, have our boots on the ground visiting the schools themselves. Now, in Lagos in particular, I understand that because many people were visiting schools in Lagos to have intervention, so government, Lagos state government had to have rules. So we are an association. 
And thankfully, we have um, a Lagos State Safety Commission that um, is hands on. We, work, we should walk through them and get approvals. Once you get that letter of approval from Lagos State uh, Ministry of Education, it allows you to enter any school, any public school. So that helps solve that problem of entry because one of the problems to enter a public school is do you have the approval to enter? But as an association, when we secure that letter and cascade it to all our partners in different locations, it means that entry is no longer going to be a problem. So that we are trying to solve this problem from two sides. Yes, we keep on pushing government. Government, you need to help push it out, let it spread. But we too, boots on the ground, use leveraging our resources, safety professionals. There are some safety professionals that I know that have never set foot in a school to teach children. Because they're like, ah, no, that's not where the money is. But <laughs> this is work that needs to be done. And so it, it's, um, it's, it helps if both, both, both parties are working together. So the government and then the associations, we need to work hand in hand to make it happen. Let me see. Okay, um, there is another question. Please unmute yourself. Sorry, is that, is that me? Yes, that's fine. Please. All right. Um, well, thank you for the presentation and thank all the organizers for putting this together. Um, this is my first time joining um, uh, African, um, West African meetings. I think my question is, we live in a very communist uh, style in West Africa. How do we help these children to identify trusted adults. Because, you know, what, what I see is the most big problem when I was growing up was we trust everybody. We trust everybody in the community we live, you know, even your, your mom's um, sister, your mom's brothers and things like that. How do we help children to identify who they can trust? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that question. It's a very, very important question because we've had cases, you know, people would say a trusted adult is your parents. It could be your parents, it could be your teacher, it could be um, your religious leader, it could be a family member. But then there have been cases where it is that trusted adult who is actually abusing the child. So maybe a father molesting a daughter or um, a religious leader, a pastor molesting um a child that's in their church. So when we're speaking to children about who a trusted adult is, it is important to give them many options so that if they check and the one that they are supposed to go to is part of the abuse, they have an alternative. There was a story that broke out on social media some years ago where a boy was in the school of the deaf in Abuja, in Kuje, and he was being molested. And because, um, and he wasn't the only one, apparently it was happening to many students in that school. And then it seems like maybe they would give them something to take so that they don't remember what happened or something. Anyway, it was time to go back to school because I, I don't remember if it's a day or a boarding school, it was time to go back to school and a boy did not want to go back to school. Now, because he is hearing him impaired, his parents don't know how to communicate um, communicates with him in Thailand, but his grandmother picks up a bit. So she was wondering, why don't you want to go? And then he told her what was going on. So apparently he had been trying to communicate with his parents, but you know, there was that barrier. So they couldn't, um, they couldn't, um, they couldn't, they didn't know what he was saying. They just felt he was just being a difficult child, doesn't want to go to school and all that. But it was when he told his grandmother, he was able to communicate. That led to um, investigation because it was talked about on radio. Then investigation happened. In fact, the whole Abuja para paraphernalia had to go. They shut down that school for a bit to do investigation. And there was stories about, you know, giving them whether it was flesh or blood or stuff. And it was, it was a really dicey situation. But we wouldn't have known if a child did not somehow communicate to somebody, his grandmother. So it was not even a direct parent. It was a grandmother who he knew cared about him, who he could communicate with. And so that's why it's very important that we let them know the options. So 
priority should be parents, right? Father, mother, if there is an elder sibling. Next priority should be your favorite teacher in school. Who is that teacher that you know that you are comfortable with that you can tell what is going on? Because believe it or not, there are children who are not able to say what is going on to the people that they are living under the same roof with. So maybe their house helps. But maybe they have a teacher who has identified the talent in them, who can see that this one is a good child that is going somewhere. And maybe they can be free to speak to that person. So giving children options, make them know that anyhow things happen, there is always at least somebody that you can take this matter to. But you see, it's not enough to now have the children speaking to the trusted adults. The next level is that these trusted adults, when a child tells you something like this, you must not dismiss it as, ah, they're just children, they're just talking. No, what you are doing is you are shutting them up so that they will not be able to tell you when something else happened. Listen, act like you are going to take action. It is wrong that children are already saying with confidence because the boy in the story I mentioned in this um, being molested uh, by his lesson teacher. He said his mother would kill him, that they should not tell the mother. She they said it would be a secret. He was so vehement, don't tell my parents, don't tell my parents. Why should a child be that convinced that your first action as a parent, when you hear something, is that you will kill them? And this is happening everywhere because I remember going to a school in Abuja and a five-year-old told me that someone was touching a private part. And I asked her, so what did you do? So she told her mom, what did your mommy do? My mommy did not do anything. How can your mommy not do anything? And how are you, a five-year-old, you are so sure that your mommy did not do anything. So that means there was no conversation. So we've got to take it to the next level that as much as we are teaching children to speak up when things happen, when they now speak up, we must seem, we must look like we're taking action. We must look like we're in their corner, affirming them and saying, we're going to get to the bottom of this. There are systems to protect you. This person can actually be jailed. It builds their confidence because they know that you are in their corner. And if something happens tomorrow, they can come back and tell because they know that you are going to fight for them. So I've mentioned that, you know, give them as many options as possible. And then the next thing is that when they now come to the adult, the adults must be willing to take action. Thank you, Gochi. Thank you so much. We're actually running out of time. This is a very interesting topic. But, um, President, can we give you one minute to speak, please, so that we can wrap up the question and answer? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add to the question somebody asked and uh, the presenter answered him. I just wanted to draw our attention that uh, ASSP and then chapter has uh, one time sent a bill to the house for the inclusion of uh, HSC, I mean, safety in our child education. And I think that thing is still in the house. If I have not forgotten, some people who realize the past administration has uh, done very well and we are still following up with that sincerely so that it will be in our curriculum. Thank you very much. I think that what I wanted to add. Okay, thank and you. Also, the last question I wanted to ask is uh, when you show us that uh, one of the girls, uh, child that have saved uh, the life of somebody by through watching the film, the movie. So, my question here is wouldn't you think that uh, the implication of watching the films too can contribute to the child uh, self uh, behaviors? Maybe there should be a selected uh, films if it is in the cartoon or something, but in the real movie, I think the implication is more. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that question. So what I have found is that entertainment works. Many people, the first time I started going to schools in Nigeria to teach them about safety, when I would ask the children, what is the emergency number in, in Lagos? They would say 911 because they have watched so many American movies where any little emergency people are calling 911. Entertainment is a great way to make a message ingrained in the minds of people. It's just like many of the music. Many times you did not set out to learn most of the music our Nigerian artists um, produce. But one day you just hear yourself singing it. Why? Because <laughs> it has probably been played around you on the radio station, on your way to work or somewhere, and your mind absorbed some lines out of it. So it's the same thing here. 
yes, it is true that we must be mindful of, you know, what films our children are watching to ensure that it is um, PG rated, it is age appropriate, but as much as it is PG um, rated, it is important that it's not only in cartoons that we can put in safety messages, even in normal acting, and that's why um, it's a problem when you see an emergency in a Nigerian um, series or movie, and the, what they are doing is they are just shouting. Nobody is making a move to make any call. Nobody is trying to do CPR or trying to do some incident uh, management. And that is, it, it, so it's not good because it is what people see over and over again, what they behold over and over again determines the actions they will take. If we begin to sip it in, we're not saying just make a safety video, no. Slip it into normal entertainment that, oh, there was an emergency and you know, instead of people taking pictures, they were um, on the scene, somebody was applying first aid. And before the person even set out to do the first aid, the person ensured that they, was, um, they cleared the space, the person ensured that they wore gloves because you don't want um, to touch um, um, bodily fluids. It might seem little, but it, has, it will sink into the person's mind. And the day they actually need that body of information, it bubbles up to the top of their minds. So yes, cartoons are great, games are great, but it doesn't hurt even in normal movies to begin to put, because even some adults are still not doing the right thing. As one of the ways we can infiltrate society is by leveraging the entertainment systems, our music, our, our, our video, movies, now, movies are actually very popular on the African continent. In fact, go to all these African countries, they will tell you about Nollywood more than you that you're in Nigeria. <laughs> it's always very interesting to see. So that tells you how it can propagate a message fast. And yes, of course, whilst doing that, we're ensuring that we're not um, showing things that are above the age grade of the children. Okay, thank you so much, Ugochi. You are really, really grateful. We can go on and on and on. Thanks for the sacrifice because you should be, you may have been asleep by now, but you're here sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. So thank you, thank you. And thanks for everyone for making it so interactive. Um, so I'll call on first to Zorepo to um, give us closing remarks and the announcement before we wrap up. Mr. Festus, please, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for. Uh, this wonderful section. Uh, I have two things before the closing remarks. Uh, permit me, uh, Wise, to actually recognize uh, one of our director who has taken time to join us even on this meeting. Maybe most of us may not have uh, noticed. Uh, in person of uh, engineer Kamil Abiodun, is our ASSP area director, area nine and he has always uh, been supportive and uh, I'm not surprised for him joining us once again, even uh, on this call. Thank you very much for joining us, um, our area director. We really appreciate. Um, some of and a few announcements we have. Um, let's not forget that this evening we'll be having uh, another webinar, uh, which is uh, going to be taken by Larry Wilson, defenseless uh, moment. So please, I want to encourage every one of us to equally make our time to join uh, this all important meeting. Then of course, uh, another of our interest group, which is um, young emerging professionals, of course, they are also organizing a workshop on the 23rd of July, 2022. Please, let's make our time to also join. I want to believe this is going to be a challenge now because uh, from all what uh, our resource person had said uh, concerning the roles we need to play, I want us to take time to come and listen to how we can also influence uh, the next generation of uh, OS, is, uh, OSH uh, professionals. And I believe it's going to be a top notch and we are going to learn a lot from that. Um, also, let's not forget that 2nd of July, we are going to be having visual and bi visual by monthly and handover from uh, Chicago. Uh, you know, these present executives will soon be handing over. So please let us join by the time uh, the um, program is rolled out and it's going to be shared on all the ASSP platform. And on the 6th of August, precisely, is going to be the physical end of when every one of us might have returned from the US. So let's just uh, keep that.
that uh, in mind. And uh, to as many of us that will be going to the US, please, let's try as much as possible to uh, private, private chat the uh, president. He has told us that we should reach out to him. So, you know, whenever we are traveling Nigeria chapter, of course, they, they recognize us when we're in the US and we always want to do things uh, differently at every point in time. So those are a few announcements I have. And uh, in closing remarks, I honestly uh, want to really appreciate our resource person. It's this uh, top-notch uh, presentation. We really appreciate you, uh, Ugochi Obidegu. Thank you for uh, making our time to actually uh, speak to us. And I know uh, the, the board has been passed across to us. We'll actually have a role to play. Uh, as safety professionals. She has actually told us, of course, we cannot rule out uh, collaboration and partnership with the government. This is very, very key. We just need to step up. And uh, when we are doing that, it actually has to be intentional. We just need to be intentional about it. Advocacy, we cannot rule it out. So all these things uh, coming into play, the whole uh, bulk of work is in our hands. So uh, uh, my take home here is, honestly, we just don't need to just listen to uh, this beautiful presentation without acting. We just need to act so that uh, we can save uh, uh, all of these children uh, when it comes to giving them the required knowledge as it regards uh, safety education. So uh, thank you very much, Wise, for organizing this uh, meeting. And uh, uh, I really want to say um, I'm well pleased to have been part of the women. You know, if you as a man, you are able to relate with women, definitely, you know, it's a whole lot. So I really appreciate our women uh, for actually having me and they're uh, working together with me. And uh, I want to say, you've actually raised a big bar uh, for the next executive. And uh, I have no doubt that uh, they are actually going to uh, keep up the, the standard. So, Vice uh, Administrator, we thank you and all your executives, uh, the ASSP executives, president, and all the rest, we appreciate you. And to every one of us on this call, we really want to thank you for making our time even to join this um, webinar. Uh, thank you very much. And once again, we indeed thank uh, Ugochi Obidegu for this wonderful presentation. We appreciate you. And on behalf of WISE, I want to say, I hope if you are being called upon next time, you are obliged. Thank you very much. And uh, let us have a wonderful weekend and prepare for the next webinar at 5 p.m. Thank you and God bless. All right, thank you, Mr. Festus. Please, before we go, can we just turn on our video so that we can take a picture, a group picture? Thank you. Okay. We're not smiling. I can see Monica. <laughs> Hi, Camille. Good to see you too. How are you doing? My area director. My Good president. I can see you. I can see my president. So you can't see me. Hey, Mr. Festival, I'm seeing your glasses now. <laughs> <laughs> His glasses. <yeah. laughs> Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. How are you, Mr. Festus? How are you? I'm fine, madam. <laughs> ah, well done. <laughs> My original.